Welcome all of you who have coming come to hear Julie Sandorf. And I just say a few words about some of you remember Julie from her earlier, her earlier talk here uh, within the last year or two. Um, uh, since then, she's done something amazing in New York. You all know about the decline and some and the decline of local news. Uh, she'll tell you more in detail about it. But uh, the, the truth of the matter is that she is one of the people in the country who is doing something about it, has done something about it. Uh, and uh, it's really a very inspiring kind of thing. As you know, that Julie, Julie is president of the Charles H. Revson Foundation. She's been president now for 12 years, 13 years actually. Um, and before joining Revson, she was a co-founder and executive director of Nextbook, which is a national organization dedicated to the creation and promotion of Jewish literature, culture, and the arts. From 1991 through 1999, she was the president of the Corporation for Supportive Housing, uh, an organization she, found, she founded that worked to deliver permanent solutions to chronic homelessness in partnership with philanthropic foundations, nonprofit organizations, and government of local, state, and national levels. Um, she has been, she's worked at the Ford Foundation. She's been a consultant uh, to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, she's a, uh, she is a member of the advisory board of the Oak Foundation um, and uh, has been a consultant to the Rockefeller Foundation and the Pew Charitable Trust. I don't know anybody who's been a consultant to more foundation than Julie has. Um, in any event, she is an advisor to the Oak Foundation. Um, she's vice, vice chair of the board of directors of the Center for Urban Community Services. Um, she's a member of the West Side Federation for Senior and Supportive Housing. She's also a, a director of the A.M. and Ruth C. Fleischmann Foundation um, uh, and many other, many other efforts. Mostly, and the reason I wanted her to come back was since she was here the last time, she has really done something significant in, in orchestrating the creation of a, of a site for news in New York City. That's all it does is it, it actually reports the news of all, uh, all parts of New York City. And I've asked her to talk about what she did uh, and how, what it took to get it done. Um, and I'm, she, I asked her to also to talk a little bit about the history of the Revison Foundation and its current grant making before she gets into more detail about what she's most recently done. So Julie, welcome. Thank you so much for coming back. Congratulations on the, your leadership in trying to do something about the rapid decline of local news. And we're eager to hear what, you, what you've done. Joel, thank you so much for the incredibly generous and gracious introduction. Um, I am really honored to be able to talk to this wonderful group. I also just want to thank Imani Walker, who has been so generous and kind and patient in um, basically welcome, making Mom. this afternoon work. So uh, <laughs> here's to you, Imani. <laughs> thank you. Um, you know, I, I want to start by saying how how much I wish I could be with all of you at Duke and at Durham. Um, it was, I have been to lecture at the Ferg Ser seminars, I think two or three times before this. And it's mm -hmm. such a thrill to be able to walk through that beautiful campus. And I hope I'll be able to do it again in the future. Mm -hmm. um, but in the meantime, I am sitting in the Upper West Side uh, of New York City and bring you greetings from New York, where it may snow here too tonight, actually. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I will start just by giving those of you who are not familiar with the Revson Foundation just a brief overview of who we are and what we do. Uh, the foundation was created in 1976 from the estate of Charles Revson, who was the founder of the Revlon Cosmetics Corporation. Um, and the foundation's program areas were determined by the executors of his estate based on his giving and his interest in giving um, uh, during his life. And those four areas are education, urban affairs, Jewish life, and biomedical research. Um, 
Most of our grant making is in New York, uh, with the exception of our Jewish Life grants, which are national and in Israel, including a wonderful partnership we have with Imam Abdullah and Tepli and Yossi Klein Halevi at the Hartman Institute, which we cherish. Um, we have an endowment now of about $200 million. The geographic focus um, is, is primarily New York. And our focus over the past decade or so has really been true to Mr. Redson's um, intentions, which was to expand knowledge and create and, and to in innovate. That was, that was his mandate. He gave no other direction other than to expand knowledge and to innovate. And so what we've done over the past decade is to try to make good on his intent and um, through the reinvention and revitalization of branch libraries, which are one pillar, one critical pillar of civic and social and intellectual life and mobility, certainly in New York City. Um, and through uh, long-term investment in reinventing local journalism, and actually more recently over the past year and a half, uh, more active engagement in um, election reform and voter participation, as that really, as we see as the third pillar of civic life and is woefully inadequate in New York. In fact, much to many people's surprise, the Brennan Center ranks New York as 45th out of 50 states in access to voting in this country. Um, so those are sort of our three pillars. Um, the foundation has had a longstanding interest in media, and I would be remiss if I did not note that the founding president is a son of of the Revson Foundation is a, is a dear son of Durham, Eli Evans, uh, who was born and raised in Durham and was a friend and colleague of Joel's in college and beyond. And Eli had a very intense interest in how a media can play a role in civic life. In our first three decades, uh, Revson was the driving force in the creation of Abba Eben's History, Civilization, and the Jews, uh, bringing Sesame Street to Israel, um, innovating in public television with Bill Moyer's Genesis, and more recently in documentary films such as Makers, Make Women Making the, the World, again with PBS. Um, so it was basically a natural continuation of this work. Um, our involvement in journalism. Um, and I guess, you know, the first thing I want to talk about is why, why is journalism important? Why does local journalism matter? Um, it had been historically a commercial enterprise financed by profit-making institutions. Why should, why should any of us actually care if local journalism thrives in our communities? Um, and I'd argue a few things. One is that it is the connective tissue. And without that, we really do lose the common knowledge of what's going on across the street, across our city, across our state, and across our country. Um, it supplies honest information for the most part, or has been, um, both monumental and routine. It serves as the civic watchdog holding our institutions of power accountable. And for philanthropy, quite frankly, there is an absolutely inextricable link between advancing philanthropic mission and journalism's role in amplifying the most important issues that affect the health and welfare of our communities. Um, I, I would just like you all to imagine, just for a minute, what our communities, what we would do without reliable, trustworthy news that informs the public and holds those institutions of power accountable. Just imagine for a minute 
living through this past year, or quite frankly, the past four years, without access to honest, trustworthy, rigorous and reliable sources of information. We all know how disinformation has affected the civic life of our own communities, of our cities, of our country. Um, and what we've also seen and, and recent research has shown uh, is that the loss of local journalism leads to an increase in municipal borrowing costs because government expenditures go unscrutinized. It leads to a diminution of citizens' knowledge and voter participation. It leads to reduced political competition in local electoral races, including mayoral races. And as we've all experienced uh, in the most unfortunate of ways, it has led to a hyper-focus on national politics and much greater political polarization. <laughs> I, just speaking parochially as a New Yorker, could not imagine having lived through the past 10 months of COVID-19 in New York City, in a city where the state and the city did not give reliable information um, or up-to-date information about the spread of the disease. There were incredible mixed messages of what was going on, and without reliable sources of news, the people of New York would have been flying completely blind. Um, I, I like to say that in absence of a vaccine or as we wait for a vaccine, information's the best medicine. And local journalism is the way that information gets brought to communities, particularly folks um, who may not have other resources to access that information. And so why, am, why are we so concerned about this issue? Um, because I'd say we have probably experienced, we have experienced the greatest revolution in the distribution of information in our world since the creation of the Gutenberg printing press. The internet has completely disrupted and changed how we have relationships, how we receive information, how we know what's going on down the block and around the world. Um, and it has completely upended the viability of the local news industry. Um, for example, Facebook, I mean, and, and the internet platforms, um, we can talk about, I, this is not a conversation, and I am no expert on the kind of disruptions that the, that the internet platforms have created in our social and political lives, but in terms of completely undermining uh, a business model for local news, which relied on classified ads, general advertising and print circulation for their revenues, which subsidized the production of the information we need to lead our lives every day, that business model was completely upended. Facebook and Google capture upwards of 80% of advertising revenue that, that used to go to newspapers. To give you a few statistics, Total newspaper advertising in 2000 exceeded $48 billion. In 2008, it was, in 2018, it was down to $14 billion. And just last year alone, Google earned almost $5 billion from news, none of which they created themselves. They are not content creators, they are distributors. Since 2004, 25% of local news outlets, that is 2,100 local newspapers have shut down. According to a recent Brookings Institution report, of the 2,485 2, counties that have reported COVID-19 cases, 57% have, la have lacked a local newspaper. 
And the consolidation of the local press by hedge funds and private equity, um, private equity firms uh, have basically rendered the nation's 6,700 newspapers, local newspapers, into what uh, UNC professor Penelope Abernathy calls ghost newspapers with greatly diminished newsrooms. Um, to give you a sense of what this financial consolidation has done, three investment companies now own or control 45% of our country's daily news outlets, including Gannett, McClatchy, Tribune Company, and Lee Enterprises, with no clear path to profitability, and the only clear path to making money is cost-cutting. Uh, to give you one example, in August 2019, the Gannett Gatehouse merger took on $1.8 billion in debt and had a market value of 1.4 billion. In April, 2020, the business was valued at $88 million, from $12 a share to 65 cents a share. And Gatehouse Gannett represents 30% of local news coverage and is now facing cuts of between 400 and 500 million dollars a year. Just last February, uh, McClatchy declared bankruptcy because of an 80% drop in ad revenue over the past 10 years and $535 million in unfunded pension liabilities. And that hits home in North Carolina. The Charlotte Observer and the Raleigh News and Observer are two of 30 McClatchy newspapers now under the ownership of an investment fund. And COVID-19, very, very sadly, is putting the last nail in the coffin of local news, local commercial news. To give you a few examples, um, overall advertising revenue uh, for commercial new daily local newspapers have dropped a further 30 to 50%. In May, the LA Times reported to have lost an additional 30% of ad revenue with furloughs and layoffs. The Tribune Company, uh, of which our own dear New York Daily News is part of, has issued 10% permanent pay cuts. New York Post, over a dozen reporters were laid off in May. Daily News has also announced a new round of cuts. And since the advent of COVID, 36,000 journalists have been laid off or have had their pay reduced. Um, with devastating effects. So what do we do about this? Um, and how do we dig ourselves out of this very kind of frightening um, civic, civic hole? Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about what the Redson Foundation is doing and how we came to this. Um, People look at New York City and say, you don't have any problems. You're the media capital of the world. You've got you know, two of the three major national newspapers as your home, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Uh, how could you possibly be a news desert? Well, when I got to the foundation in 2008, I noticed something very strange. I noticed that the New York Times standalone robust metro section had been folded into their national paper. I noticed that the New York Sun went out of business. I noticed that um, El Diario, the premier Spanish language paper was on its last legs. And it was very strange and very puzzling. And it was the canary in the coal mine. And since, and since 2008, um, the New York Times has become an extremely profitable news operation, and primarily because they have become the nation's foremost national and international news operation. Well over 90% of the New York Times digital news subscribers are not from New York. Uh, the, and that they have, at this point, have gone from a metro section inside the national paper to no metro section, 
uh, they um, have reduced their daily Betra stories from in 2001, 163 a week to now 48. And today I paid special attention because I knew I was talking to you. And in the print paper of the New York Times today, there is not a single article related to New York. At the same time, um, the city, which is a, a new nonprofit news operation we helped create, uh, had a story about who was getting vaccinations in New York City, which is the single most important issue facing 9 million people in my hometown. Um, uh, it was very, very striking to me that there was nothing reported in the, in the New York Times about New York today. Um, the Daily News has closed all its borough branches, its borough news desks. They've cut over 70% of their reporting staff. And with the advent of COVID, they actually have cut, they have actually eliminated their physical offices. There is no New York Daily News office in New York anymore. Um, the Wall Street Journal, which, greed, which created its own metropolitan section in 2010, is now less than one page in the national section. The Village Voice is closed. The New York Sun is closed. El Diario is a shadow of its former self. Um, we have seen the results of this incredible diminution of local coverage in New York um, over the past, I, you know, anecdotally, we see what happens when nobody is covering City Hall. Um, corruption happens. Um, negligence in spending taxpayer dollars happens. Mismanagement happens, and that's true at the city and the state level. Um, so beginning in about 2009, 2010, when we started seeing, when Rebson started seeing the writing on the wall, we decided to take on this notion of strengthening local journalism as a public service and as a critical pillar of the civic life of our city of 8.5 million people. And since then, we've made about $11 million uh, in investment uh, in a variety of ways. Um, we, and I will quickly go through those. Um, first, the direct support of local journalism, both in topic-specific nonprofit news outlets like Chalkbeat that covers New York, Documented New York, who covers immigration, the Marshall Project on some criminal justice, the Brooklyn Movement Center, building out the local newsroom of our local public radio station, uh, creating ProPublica's first local news desk, which I'm very proud of, um, which led to their 20 city local reporting network with, with uh, for profit and nonprofit local news operations. It started in New York with us um, and supporting the commercial and, and, and editorial viability of the 250 plus network of community and ethnic media. Um, New York ha is a city which whose population probably speaks to close to 200 different languages. And we have a very community-based local press that serves them first and foremost. Uh, secondly, nurturing a talent pipeline. And we, have, we support the Newmark School of Journalism at CUNY, providing scholarships to uh, students of color and for uh, immigrants who are undocumented um, to enable them to go to be journalists uh, and graduate from journalism school debt free. Uh, journalism is not a, a, a occupation where you've got big salaries coming out at the end. So 
our, our deep desire is to see newsrooms reflective of the city we live in. And this is our, our way of supporting, creating and nurturing that, that pipeline. Um, and the, the third piece of our work is to help create an infrastructure to support um, the flourishing of a local news ecosystem. And there, and I will talk about the, the two ways we've, we're doing that. Um, one is through an investment in the Cornell University First Amendment Legal Clinic, where um, we are funding a clinic and a practicing lawyer to provide pro bono services to nonprofit uh, journalism in the New York metro area um, for Freedom of Information Request Acts, for defending journalists in liables, you know, in different kinds of defamation and other suits to help nonprofits incorporate and so on. Um, and that's been very successful. And, and the last is a, a effort that we that I'll talk about, um, about creating a very strong source of revenues for community media in New York. But the first case I would like to talk about is um, our single largest investment to date. Um, and that is cr the creation of, and startup of a brand new news operation in New York very much based on um, what had come before us in the Texas Tribune and Min Post and Vermont Digger. We really looked far and wide for great models for New York to fill what was gaping holes in, in coverage of the civic life of our city. Um, we spent, 18 months, and basically I spent 18 months um, putting this effort together. And I will start by saying startups are not for the faint of heart. Um, we are reinventing new models of journalism um, from the ashes of a market failure. And there are no silver bullets, and it is very hard to do. Um, we first by, started by researching the local news landscape and, and looked at what the biggest gaps were, and not surprisingly, it was beat reporting. Um, there were no reporters covering boroughs anymore, and to give you a sense of this, the borough of Brooklyn has the same population as the city of Chicago, and there was not a single reporter focused on the borough of Brooklyn from any of the citywide commercial newspapers in 2017, 2018. Nobody was covering the courthouses and the City Hall Press Corps had gone from 24 reporters to four reporters. So there was clearly a necessity to, to cover the boroughs and cover very specific beats. Um, I had the very good fortune of having tremendous expertise in New York in both the media industry and journalism, and we created a kitchen cabinet of experts, including the president of ProPublica, the founder of the Marshall Project, the dean of the CUNY Journalism School, to help shape what, what both the editorial and business model should be. We learned from other nonprofit startups. And we launched in April 2019 with about $9 million in hand, um, knowing that we needed a runway of at least two years to get going. Um, it was very, very important. First of all, Revson is a very small foundation that we had a group of funders who were deeply invested in growing a serious and sustainable nonprofit news operation. Um, so we launched with two partners, the Leon Levy Foundation 
and Craig Newmark Philanthropies, and also with about four or five other individual donors uh, who are willing to take this leap of faith with us. Um, we hired both an editor-in-chief and a publisher um, so that we had strength on both the editorial and business side. And we created a board of directors that represented both business, journalism, and civic life in New York. Um, and we knew that with a three million, three and a half million dollar uh, annual operating budget, we were not going to be able to cover everything. So we, so the editor in chief looked at very clear topics to to focus on, very clear beats to focus on, and also understood, for example, that covering healthcare also meant covering public housing in New York because so, so many public health issues and serious health issues are, are a result of deterioration of public housing. So there was also a blending of different topics and different beats. Um, the, the city launched in 2019 with special topic beats in housing, criminal justice, health and health care, fiscal responsibility, and campaign finance. There was a very strong emphasis on accountability and watchdog journalism that drove action for public benefit, and that ranged from everything from getting a streetlight fixed to revealing the corruption at City Hall and the corruption of the mayor's campaign finances, um, which some say led to him not being able to get any traction in running for president. Um, we also, the, the city also decided that they needed to be an explanatory, they needed to provide explanatory information and information that would be useful to the daily lives of New Yorkers. So for example, when the pandemic struck, there was no information available from city or state sources on, uh, on a neighborhood level and at a hospital level of where the pandemic was striking and how many people were being affected. And the city put together a COVID tracker that every day tracked everything from, you know, number of cases, number of positives, how many people were in the hospital, deaths, et cetera, um, and are now doing that for vaccinations, they were the only source that one could go to um, until the city actually got its act together to provide good information. Um, they are also doing explanatory newsletters uh, for to inform people about unemployment insurance, about what they should do about evictions, um, the day-to-day -day information that's not easily accessible at this point through government sources and is certainly not being given by traditional news sources. Um, and they also put an a huge emphasis on engagement. Um, they immediately created a partnership with the Brooklyn Public Library uh, to hold open sessions in branch libraries all over Brooklyn, asking community residents to talk about what they wanted to know and what information was most important to them. And through that, they created incredible sources and were able to crowdsource amazing stories. Um, and they, and through that engagement, they've created something called Missing Them. And I strongly urge any, anyone who's interested to take a look at this. They are working with uh, the CUNY Journalism School and the Columbia Journalism School students and creating memorials for every single person who has died due to COVID in New York City. And it is the living compendium of loss in our city. Um, no one else is doing that. Um, and another example of engagement is their partnership with Chalkbeat, where they are covering special education in New York 
and which has not been covered by the mainstream press. And 2,000 parents are crowdsourcing uh, with them information and issues related to the challenges of, public, of special education in the public schools in New York. Um, they put out a daily newsletter uh, that has 35,000 subscribers at this point with a 45% open rate, which is kind of amazing. Um, and they are also putting out special newsletters on eviction, unemployment, and the 2021 elections in, in New York. Um, their reach, their average monthly unique visitors in 2020 ranged from, in January 2020, 200,000 to, in May, 1.2 million. Uh, right now, the average reach of unique visitors are between 500 and 600,000 um, and are growing. Um, they began when they launched with 370,000 page views, and that went to over 2.2 million in May and April, of um, right at the height of, of COVID in New York. Um, Part of the importance of engagement and, and revenue development is creating a membership base. It also uh, is an indication of whether this news, because it is free, is of value. Um, and since their launch, they have 4,300 members and have raised over $600,000 in individual memberships, which are you know between 60 and $120 a person. Um, they are building a strong social media following, and um, one, of, one of the goals of the city was to support community media and both for-profit and non-profit throughout the boroughs, and I think one of the, the telling um, stories of the success is that they have, on average, 200 either mentions, links, or republications in other local news operations a month, which is literally, I don't know, you know, 70 repubs or links a, a day. Um, no, I'm doing that wrong. Uh, but it's 200 a month. Um, the business model, nobody has cracked. Uh, oh, I should say, I'd say that one of the most important trends in rebuilding the local news in any community is we are not going to see commercial enterprises scooping each other and covering all that needs to be covered because it is not commercially viable. There is no market to pay for that. What we are seeing in New York and what we're seeing around the country are smaller news organizations all partnering with each other, filling in all of the gaps that together comprise um, a more robust picture of, of what's going on in your community. And the city has is, is no exception. Uh, the partnerships they've created with Chalkbeat, which is an education nonprofit, is a joint publishing and joint reporting partnership where the city has a much larger readership and audience and they publish Chalkbeat stories probably once or twice a week and, and co-write with them. Uh, Documented New York, which is an immigration um, news site. Uh, the city is publishing all of their newsletters on documented WhatsApp Spanish language um, application, which is going out to immigrant, Spanish speaking immigrant communities all over New York. They have a partnership with ProPublica where ProPublica and the city are jointly reporting for two years on uh, the New York City Police Department, which is a major issue in New York. Uh, other Partnerships include Retro Report um, and a distribution partnership with the local cable station, news station Spectrum, and Apple News. Uh, they're one of five local news sites that distribute content through Apple News um, and, and through journalism schools. So it's going to take a village or a 
a whole bunch of folks to recreate what we've lost, but I, I think we're on our way. Um, the revenue model, nobody has cracked this code yet. Uh, it is basically what John Thornton, who is the founder of uh, the Texas Tribune, calls revenue promiscuity, which is create as broad a base of support as possible. But I will argue that to launch and to get started, philanthropy must be the loss leader. Um, we, when markets fail, philanthropy, whether it is individual donors, foundations or major donors step up and support public service. And one of our biggest challenges is to convince and educate both the public and philanthropy that local news is no longer a commercial enterprise. It is a public service. It was always a public service. It was just commercially subsidized. It is no longer commercially subsidized. And for the time being, it will have to be in part supported by civic and philanthropic sources. Um, the revenue mix is a combination of corporate sponsorship, um, foundations, individual donors, uh, in some cases events, um, but we have a long way to go before we see a robust sustaining um, picture of, um, of revenue sources in this, you know, in a field that's in its infancy. And I feel very strongly that um, philanthropy has to be patient. We are reinventing a new field uh, and one that is absolutely critical to everything else that happens in our communities. Um, if you're a foundation that cares about health and health care, or cares about public policy, or cares about housing, if cares about you know, fiscal responsibility, uh, without being able to amplify these issues and bring them to light um, to the public, the philanthropic mission will be diminished. And their philanthropy and an ability to inform citizens go hand in hand. Um, and we've got a bit of work to do in having that be the rule and not the exception. Uh, I am trying to think of, I guess I'd like to end on a, on a positive, on a very happy, positive note. When I think, when I, when I look forward in, in this field, um, over the past decade, 300 nonprofit news outlets have been established. $500 million in philanthropic revenue has been dedicated to these outlets. It does not begin to replace the $23 billion that's been lost, but it's a start. And there are some exciting new ideas coming to the fore. Um, there is a new coalition of nonprofit news organizations and for-profit news organizations called the We Build no Local News Coalition. And they are putting forward uh, national, at a national level, some very interesting ideas. Uh, one is a $2,500 tax credit for small businesses to buy local advertising in local news outlets. Uh, another is public funding like the Corporation for Public Broadcasting to go to match local funds raised for local news outlets. Another is a $250 refundable tax credit for individuals to, buy, to subscribe or to donate to local news organizations. Um, and then lastly, and this was something we pioneered in New York, um, is to tap into uh, public sector advertising buys um, to support local news. So in New York, and this really began in 2013, uh, the Resident Foundation funded a study of what the city of New York spent and 
what they spent it on in their advertising buys. And they were spending somewhere around $18 million in, in adver public advertising, and it was going to the four major newspapers. Um, and about 18% was going to the community media. Um, even though if they were placing ads in community media, not only would have been far less expensive, but they would have had much better, better micro-targeting of the populations they wanted to reach. Um, and about two years ago, about a year and a half ago, uh, after lots of lobbying and cajoling, Mayor de Blasio uh, created an executive order that required city agencies to dedicate 50% of their ad buys to community and ethnic media. We funded the Center for Community and Ethnic Media to, to basically be, create a brokerage that would be the honest broker between 250 news, community news operations and the city um, to create basically a pipeline and a way for the city to place these ads in community newspapers. It exceeded beyond our wildest dreams. Um, last year, for the first year, um, over $10 million of, I think it was something like $14 million of city ad budget um, from 30 agencies went to the community and ethnic media. It literally saved this these news operations during COVID because they would have otherwise been completely reliant on local businesses. Almost all of them had shut down and certainly weren't advertising. Um, this idea is now being floated in a number of other cities. And um, the importance of this idea is that these community news, news operations are primarily serving and are run by um, communities of color. And they're, the targeting of, for example, right now, there's a real challenge in, in encouraging communities of color to get vaccinated in New York. The best way to reach them is their local community newspapers. And so that infrastructure has been set up. It not only targets the communities that are most in need, but it also supports the the small businesses um, that these community newspapers represent. And we think there's lots of promise there. Um, and last but not least is an idea that I have, which is thinking about how we encourage our friends, our neighbors, our civic leaders to tithe perhaps one or 2% of their local giving to support local journalism through, and this is a tried and true method. Um, we have Jewish federations, we have community foundations, we have community chess, churches, where people understand that they have a civic duty to support pill pillars of civic life. And that that idea needs to be expanded to our collective support civic support of local journalism. Um, it is still an idea in formation, but, but it gives me, um, I think there are lots of examples of how this has worked in, uh, in other aspects of our civic life, and it, it is needed now more than ever. And with that, I think I probably talked way longer than I should. That was wonderful, Julie. I was fascinated, so fascinated by that I forgot that I was Muted. So the floor is now open for comments, questions, uh, any other points that anybody would like to ask Julie to comment on or views of your own about what she said. I see a question from Lizzie. How do you think about the city's partnerships when you all launched? How did you hope the reporting capacity content and resource might reinforce New York City's local news ecosystem? Um, I think they launched with an intent to have partnerships. And the very first partnership was with Chalkbeat. Um, and I, I want to say a little bit about partnerships um, because they're not easy. 
And in journalism, I've learned, and I am not a journalist, I'm just a journalist groupie, that um, partnerships, first of all, exist because of mutual self-interest um, and because it is to the benefit of the two partners. And in journalism, the partners um, have to ha produce journalism that is of content that is of quality such that the publisher, uh, the partner who is actually putting the con placing the content on their site is not overwhelmed by editing and, you know, fact checking and so on. So, you know, you don't automatically create content partnerships. There really is a quality control aspect on this. And in the case of Chalkbeat, the editor chief of the city um, knew the bureau chief of Chalkbeat and knew that the quality of content would be one that would be easily placed on the city site. Um, they also were very intentional about republication. From day one uh, on the site and in, and in all of the information, they were pushing out and strongly encouraging uh, local, both borough-wide and community news sites to republish their content. Um, so that was very intentional from the beginning. And then over time, um, these other partnerships were created. But I, I really do think that these partnerships work best when the quality of the journalism is such that everybody is comfortable that they are not going to be, because nobody's working with a rich newsroom and nobody's working with extra editors. And the, the quality of the content has to be high enough so that it requires minimal work by the host. Other questions? Hi, Julie. Uh, my name is Adam Waxman. I'm the Regional Journalism Development Director for McClatchy. I work uh, at the News and Observer and with our properties across the Southeast. I really loved what you said about sort of like this idea that like media was publicly subsidized and it's kind of not anymore, even if we pretended it wasn't. Um, so one of the challenges that I see in this work is actually around staffing. And I'm wondering if you can talk about in your experience, like for a publication to really get to a place where it's maybe sustainable or like getting there, what is the staffing requirement, even just from like an FTE perspective to have yeah. someone managing that and thinking about it? I, you know, I can only talk about how we thought about this at the city and, and right sizing at launch is tricky and important. So we looked at a city of 8.4 million people. We made a decision that we were not going to be patch or, you know, do just sort of short form quick pieces. And we also made a very clear decision that we were going to pay reporters and staff a living wage and allowed them to have a profession. Um, and that was just sort of ground rules. And then we, then the right sizing portion of this was how do we hit the ground running with a bang while not building something that is utterly unsustainable and came to for what we were trying to do. And, you know, if we had more money, I think I would make it even bigger, but uh, an editorial staff starting with 18, and that also included social media uh, staff and engagement staff. Um, and then I'd say, and then we had a four on the business side, but um, I'd beef up the business side more. And I think, you know, it, we use like Texas Tribune as sort of, they are the gold standard of local state, you know, state nonprofit. They started, I believe, with about 15. And they're now a newsroom of 80. Um, but the trick is right-sizing it so that you're not, you're not, 
you don't have a starting budget that you absolutely could not sustain, but you're big enough so that it matters. And where the editor and board came out with the city was about starting with 19, which isn't enough, quite frankly, it isn't enough. Um, I, one of the things that I would like to see happen, and I am gonna fight for this, even though I'm only a board observer, is there is no opinion page. And in New York, the only opinion, outside opinion page um, is in the daily news. You can't, you know, there's there's no op-ed page anymore for New York, and there are two opinion writers. Um, they both work for the Daily News at this point. There's one for the New York Post, but he's so like out there, I don't even include him. So I think there is a, a you know, we have a storied history of columnists in this town, from Pete Hamill to Jimmy Breslin to the recent a recent beloved memory, Jim Dwyer. Um, and that is dying. And I, I think that's one piece we do need to expand upon. And I think it drives traffic. And I think it, it engages people um, to, think, to think about issues of the day in different ways. Hi, Abdullah. So wonderful. Hi, so you. nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish you were here uh, so we could, we could really spend some time together. Uh, my question, I hope it's not too tangential, but the ideological value-based partisan divide that we see in national media between Breitbart, Fox TV on one end, CNN, MSNBC, does that ideological partisanship divide exist in the local media? Oh, or yeah. Here, it, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, absolutely. Um, the New York and, Post is, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, just go quickly, ahead, Angela. Uh, with the level of that partisanship or the ideological divide exist, did this contribute to the declining of the local media as well? Or was it purely- No, I, I don't media? think so. Not in, I can't speak for the whole country in New York. I, I mean, and I'm guessing everywhere else, it's just a complete market failure. Um, local news, when, you know, when, the internet exploded, local news didn't scale. So, you know, when BuzzFeed was created and, and all those other digital operations were created, it was all about scale. New York Times is the most profitable news organization in this country now because they scaled nationally and internationally digitally. And their revenue base is almost, it, it's pretty much entirely subscriptions. Um, and local news doesn't scale. You've got a defined geography and Facebook and Google are much better at micro-targeting advertising to a local audience than a local newspaper will ever be. So I, I, I really do believe that this was far more a market failure than anything else, certainly in large part because the source of revenues from these papers were just sucked up by the platforms and, and Craigslist. I, I will admit, although Craig has been hugely uh, generous in helping to rebuild local news. Um, in New York, yes. I mean, we're a democratic city, but we are also a news city that two major news operations are owned by um, Rupert Murdoch, the Wall Street Journal, which their New York reporting is straight up reporting. It's not ideological. Uh, and the news, New York Post, which is extremely ideological and particularly in New York, um, bordering on non-credible. Um, I would say, you know, for the city in part because it's nonprofit, so it can't do endorsements, it is, rigorously nonpartisan um, and will go after institutions of power no matter who they are. Um, and I think the resistance to having an opinion page and columnists and op-ed contributors is the editor-in-chief's um, strong resistance to partisanship. Um, but I, you know, I, I 
we could argue whether the Times, I mean, you know, I think the Times has become partisan, but they, they're they not focusing on local news. So it's not a big issue. And the Daily News, yeah. unfortunately, is on its last legs. We can ask Barry Wise whether uh, the Times have been partisan or not. Yeah, it's a commercial failure. Um, that's that's what we're experiencing. Um, I think that's what you're experiencing in North Carolina too. In these amazing news operations that that have taken huge financial hits. Other questions? We have Kristen Goss. I put mine in the chat. Um, so what I wrote was in my undergrad class today, and I'm sorry, I was a little late. We were finishing at 4.45. Uh, the question of the day was, what is one thing a philanthropist could do to enhance American democracy? And a lot of students actually focused on improving the media. They thought that showing up local media in particular might have the side of benefit of enhancing trust in democratic governance. But they were also really worried about media literacy and how to mm -hmm. make young people better media mm -hmm. consumers, identifying misinformation and biases. And we went through a lot of different kinds of proposals and realized how, what a politically hot topic that was. And so my question was really, is there a role for philanthropy in this you know, this side of the media landscape. Yeah. And and I, I concluded by saying this former reporter who's actually married to a former reporter, thank you. There is a wonderful organization that Revson actually helped launch and launch and, and expand called the News Literacy Project. And it is run by Alan Miller, who is a former uh, LA Times Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter. And he has created this amazing organization that at first had journalists in classrooms teaching news literacy to high school students and now uh, has grown it, has scaled it so that there are um, digital curriculums that are available across the country that can be used in classrooms in middle schools and high schools. And they're actually also doing it in public libraries. Um, and I, I, anybody who's interested in that question should just look up the News Literacy Project. They've, they've exploded. Um, I think Alan was named Washingtonian of the Year last week, which is wonderful. Um, what else could philanthropy do? I, I mean, I, I am just, you know, I, I'm an evangelist for philanthropic investment in this critical public service. And we, it has been, I've been at this 11 years and it has been a hugely challenging to, you know, I think in part foundations are nervous about, you know, oh, wow, what if they print something I don't agree with, but the kind of shift in thinking from well, this is a commercial enterprise. What do we need this for? To know it is actually for the time being a public service that needs charitable support. We've got a long way to go on this. Um, and I'd say what else could, could philanthropy do? Um, and certainly philanthropy in other parts of the country are way ahead of us in New York. We are huge laggards in this, but election reform. Um, election reform and building a grassroots infrastructure to uh -huh. encourage people to get out the vote. In the last two mayoral elections in New York City, less than 23% of registered voters voted. In the South Bronx, less than 9% of registered voters voted. That is bad for New York. Um, so, I, you know, for me, the, the pillars are what are the most open um, pillars of our civic life, news and access to information and access and engagement in voting as the minimum threshold of your civic life. My question is, how important uh, to the success of the city is the partnership uh, with New York, the magazine? Yes. I'm happy to talk about that. So um, 
I would say the first seven or eight months of trying to put this together was a Sisyphean battle. Um, it was very hard to attract great talent without money. It was hard to take an abstract idea and make it real. And I was about to give up and I had an epiphany, which was um, New York Magazine, which is a storied um, weekly, well now it's bi-weekly, weekly magazine of, that covered New York. Um, had pivoted as most news operations had to a national audience because that was the only way they could remain commercially viable. And they really were not at that point in 2018 covering New York City at all. Um, it happened to be that the uh, owner of New York Magazine was a trustee of the Revson Foundation. And I called her and said, can I come to you with a crazy idea? And she said, sure, come on downtown. And I pitched the idea of a partnership where the city would be the local news counterpart to New York Magazine's national uh, work. And Adam Moss at that point was the editor of New York Magazine and David Haskell, who is deputy and is now editor of New York Magazine, loved the idea. And what that did for us was New York Magazine agreed to do all of the design work in building the website, built the website, and we were able to launch on their content management system, which at that point was one of the best in the country, uh, and have a vertical on their site. And what that gave me was an ability to say, look at the leverage we're getting. We are, we have this, you know, spectacular um, journalism enterprise backing us. Um, and at that point, New York Magazine had won more national magazine awards than I think any other magazine in the country. And it gave us the wind underneath our sails. I'd say how it's played out is um, we are still working, well now Vox bought New York Magazine. So we had the advantage of transitioning to an even more sophisticated content management system. We're under Vox and we now are able to do videos. We're able to do a lot more on the site because we're still there. Um, New York Magazine has republished some of the city's work. Uh, it has not been, and I think we will see it hopefully getting more more content partnership and relationships, but they basically allowed us to speed up our launch by about seven months because they did all the work and they saved us about a half a million dollars in startup costs because they saw this, this support and this service to the city as their philanthropic gesture to the civic life of New York City because they were just not doing what they used to do. And so it was a very unique partnership and way to begin this work. Um, and I think in large part because the ownership of New York Magazine was a private trust uh, and that the leadership of New York Magazine were extremely civic minded people. I don't think it would have, it would never have happened. In fact, I, I asked somebody in this industry, had I gone to the New York Times and said, would you like to do this with us? It would have taken six months to get an appointment. Um, and in this case, literally it was 30 days from the first conversation to signing the agreement with New York Magazine. Um, and without them, I don't think we could have launched this, quite honestly, we couldn't get the traction. Uh, are there analogies to other cities? Uh, there's no, I would, I don't know of any magazines. No. New York Magazine. Mm -mm. I mean, the, you know, there are, there are, I'm not sure there's an ownership that feels that 
this was their civic duty. Um, you know, there is Boston Magazine. I mean, there are those, nothing is sophisticated as New York Magazine. You're absolutely right. You're right. They're in a class by themselves. <laughs> um, I have a question about um, the role of universities um, in this sphere. Um, what kind of partnerships or roles do you see universities having that could best contribute to supporting local news? And I think um, Deborah has also posted a question that has like an, an intriguing aside to that. I mean, I, I can only uh, speak to the experience of the city. Um, several things. One, um, in the Missing Them project, which is an enormous project, you know, memorializing and doing events uh, around all the folks that have died of COVID in New York. The, the people actually writing these memorials are all students from Columbia Journalism School and the Newmark, Newmark Journalism School. It is staffed by these students. So that's one thing. Um, journalism students have internships at the city in the summer. Um, and I'd say lastly, and in part, it's, I think the, the city started with another very strong intentionality, which was uh, the editor in chief, Jerry Hester, who had previously been the city editor at the Daily News, um, by design wanted to create a newsroom that looked like New York City. And he had a strong relationship with the New Mark Journalism School, which 80% of the students are, are people of color. And so he looks at the journalism schools as the talent pipeline. Um, and some of their star reporters are from, from the journalism school. So I, I think there's huge opportunity and potential to partner. Um, the reporter who covers fiscal affairs for the city is the Ravitch um, fiscal reporting uh, professor at the Newmark Journalism School. So there's there's lots of back and forth, and um, I, you know, I, I I think there are like 40 journalism students working on the Missing Them project, and it, and it couldn't have been done without them. Hi, yes, uh, thanks. Thanks again, Julie. And I was just curious um, not to bring the, um, not to stop talking about news media, but just in general, um, in your work, have you encountered anything else that might be um, commercially subsidized or viable for now, but maybe in the near future could, could also be vulnerable to, you know, the same things that are happening to local news? Oh, gosh, I mean, you know, everything. I, I guess I'm sitting at the epicenter of uh, a state in the city that's looking at $15 billion in deficits and New York, five and a half billion dollars in deficits. Uh, I, you know, our public transit system is in, you know, I think they're like $2 billion deficits. So, you know, I, it is just a very difficult time. I'll give you actually a great example. I just was talking to the CEO of the YMCA's of New York, which are 24 YMCA's, and their revenue model was primarily member dues, and that the Y's in the more affluent neighborhoods cross subsidized the Y's in the poor neighborhoods. And because of COVID, they've had to close their doors since March, which means their budget has been reduced by 50%, from 200 million to 100 million. And they were heavily reliant on what would otherwise be the ideal, the wonderful model. Look at this, you have you know, earned revenue sources to support a nonprofit mission and they are now facing, you know, cutting their budget by half. And how do you rethink the role of what, you know, of the YMCAs and of how you support 
those Ys that are in neighborhoods that don't have that kind of membership base um, to provide just as high quality services. And, you know, it is, nobody would have thought that this would be a, a pressing challenge in an organization like that. So I think you're gonna see this across the board um, in for-profit and non-profit. Um, it just, in journalism, it, it, there's just, it's, it's so clear what's happening and that there's probably not a return until there are clear commercially viable ways to do this. Uh, you know, I should also say that so much of how I look at this is informed by my own experiences um, in the community development movement. Um, a similar thing happened in urban neighborhoods all over America. The market failed and there was massive disinvestment in urban neighborhoods all over the country. I just happened to work, started my professional life in the South Bronx, but the lost leaders of rebuilding those markets and they were rebuilt in New York were philanthropy, nonprofits, small, very small levels of private sector financing, you know, because of government regulation and the public sector. And in New York pre-COVID, you know, neighborhoods that had lost 90% of their population in the South Bronx are now thriving mixed income neighborhoods. Like they're, you know, the biggest worry was gentrification. Nobody was worrying about like, oh my God, people are gonna leave New York. Um, and but the pump primer to create that market was 30 years of being led by nonprofit, philanthropic, and public sector risk taking and reinvestment. And I, and I believe the same thing is going to happen with journalism. Um, I hope that answers your question. Next person will be Deborah um, Bustle. Deborah says, how might RevSent uh, support efforts in communities across the country to launch local news outlets beyond your funding of ProPublica um, to do this? We are a very small foundation and our funding in journalism is focused in New York City um, and New York State. We are not going to be funding outside of New York and but in New York, we are funding probably eight or nine different nonprofit news operations, which we hope collectively will be able to fill the gaps left by, you know, a very a commercial industry in decline. But we won't be working outside of New York. Our fund, our funding won't go. We we just we don't have the resources to do that. There are national foundations like the Knight Foundation and the Democracy Fund that are, you know, far more ambitiously funding um, the rebuilding of local news across the country. But, but it's also the case that journalism, local news have never been particularly attractive to the uh -uh. foundations in general. Uh -uh. Um, uh, it is something that they haven't done. It's something they should do, but they haven't done it. And that's, that's a right a major problem, given the role that information has in terms of uh, democracy, political political accountability, all kinds of things. That's right. They should be doing it, but they're not doing it. Right. And I would say it's in their self-interest. I, you know, I, I don't know how a foundation funds public policy initiatives or advocacy initiatives if there's no local journalism to be that megaphone and amplify those issues and bring to light um, you know, the, the ineffectiveness of institutions to deal with those issues. I don't understand how they separate the two. You, you are not going to succeed in public policy advocacy without the press. Have they, Julie, have there been any efforts to get community foundations to be more active in it? You know, the Knight Foundation, I think, has been toiling away at this. Um, I, in New York, the New York Community Trust 
invests a very, very small amount of money in local journalism. I, I think um, that is a, a fantastic, I think community foundations could represent a fantastic opportunity to be the hosts and homes of this 2% idea uh, for, uh, to, to create sustaining funds to support local news. But I, I think it's been a real challenge. Have you had any conversations with Paul Grogan? Mm -mm. I mean, if anybody in the community foundation world might find this attractive, he's one of them. And uh, no, I haven't. And I don't know if they've done anything. I, I haven't heard anything. No, they haven't. And but he, he's involved in a new project at this point. He oh. stepped, stepped down from running the Boston Foundation. Uh, and he is engaged in something broader than that. Um, oh. And oh, my, no. I would say, you know, it might be worth having a conversation with him. Okay. He used to be my boss. Uh, <laughs> when, when, when was that? Uh, when I ran the New York City List program in oh, 19, really? yeah. I'd forgotten that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a small world, isn't it? It is a small world. And much of it goes back to Mike Sveridoff. Yeah, all of it goes good. back to Mike Sveridoff. <laughs> all paths lead to Mike. <laughs> well, we're rapidly coming to the end here in terms of our allotted time. Uh, anybody else want to make a parting observation? Some a, a word from the wise? Joel, the, the one thing I might add is just a word of thanks to Julie. Uh, I may be, I was a few minutes late joining and maybe repeating some things that you said, but as we've been talking about for the last few minutes, uh, arousing journalism to their self-interest and to the public interest in supporting journalism is what ultimately may cause today's subject um, to be successful. And Julie, as much as anyone else in the United States, has been beating that drum, making that case, talking to foundation leaders. And I think when the history of uh, philanthropic support for journalism is written, uh, Julie and the Revson Foundation are going to be front and center because it needed to be put on the public agenda. And she's putting it there. So thank you. Here, here. Hey, thank you. <laughs> that, that is, that a lot is, of gray hair later. <laughs> well, I, unfortunately, um, I know from gray hair. <laughs> I would say so. Your hair is silver, not gray. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Joel. Well, thank you, Julie. It, uh, it, I, I adopt by reference everything that Jerry has said. Uh, and you know, I, I believe that. Uh, and I'm uh, glad that we have the benefit of your help, of your guidance and wisdom. Uh, here at Duke uh, and in North Carolina. Uh, and we're about, uh, now we're about to close and I don't want to lose any, to keep people over. I just simply say that we have um, uh, some interesting programs coming up uh, over, the, over the course of the next um, uh, five weeks, four weeks of the semester. The next uh, FERG session, also virtual, will be Rebecca Rimel, the longtime president uh, and CEO of the Pew Charitable Trust on February the 17th. She's wonderful, funny, and one of the most creative people <laughs> in the foundation world. Um, on March the 3rd, Hubert Jolie, longtime CEO of Best Buy uh, and now executive chairman, who's also doing a lot of work in nonprofits. Again, on March the 24th, Rip Rapson, president of the Kresge Foundation, who has earned a highly favorable reputation coming and telling us the progress in Detroit. Uh, and he's March the 24th. And finally, Adam Falk, president of the Sloan Foundation, a graduate of Chapel Hill, who's going to be speaking on April the 7th. So those are the forthcoming first speeches. We hope that you'll join us for as many of them as you can. I want to thank all of you all for coming. I want to thank, again, Imani for the great job she did in putting all this together. And most of all, thank I want you. to thank Julie for all that she did. So thank you all very much. Thank you all. Yep. Thank you all so much for joining this conversation. I'm very grateful and honored yep. to be part of it. 
Well, we're grateful and honored to have you part of it. So thank you. And, and we'll, every, everybody stay well, you hear? Stay well. Yeah. That's what yeah. I was going to say. Stay well, everyone. And I hope everyone in North Carolina gets vaccinated fast. <laughs>